All right, so what I would do is go for know, five, ten minutes, and I'll come in and, and check on it. Okay. All right? Okay, I'll try so to you're, So you're going right now, all right? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Hello. Hi, this is Kevin Stoner, and I want to welcome you to my YouTube channel. Um, I'm talking about part two of uh, Revolutions of 1989. Alas, I have to get me some water before I started because we had a technical fall Paul before I got started today. Actually, I had two of them where the um, video ran out of storage quickly. All right. Revolutions of 1989, part two. Um, retrospectively, no one could really have predicted what kind of revolutionary autumn awaited Europe in 1989. In late 1989, I found myself traveling to, the, to visit Prague, Czechoslovakia for the first time. I was planning to enjoy the great city's beauty and legendary um, music festival called the Prague Spring International Music Festival. Since I was traveling on a student budget, I slept in a train overnight coming in from Nuremberg. Um, you pass through a, a bulge of an uh, area called the Fulda Gap, and none too far are you from the Pershing II missiles, which were facing uh, the Warsaw Pact countries. The Prague Spring International Festival was founded just after World War II in 1946. Originally, the festival was intended to celebrate the end of a horrible war, World War II, and to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Prague uh, Philharmonic. The first festivals focused primarily on the Czechish music itself, but the festival eventually expanded to one of the premier international music festivals on the continent and the world. Uh, in an amazing but poignant contrast, modern historians refer with the same phrase, Prague Spring, to refer specifically to the year 1968, when Czechoslovakia's one-time head, Alexander Dubček, followed the dreams and voices of his people to create a communism or socialism in Central Europe with a much more human face. Like the Chinese solution in Tiananmen Square 21 years later, in 1989, the experiments in the Czechoslovakian people's leadership led to the occupation of various city squares across the country as heavy-handedly the small country was occupied by Soviet, Polish, East German, and other Warsaw Pact military in August of 1968. The people of the Czech and Slavic Federation had not originally sought to embrace the West with the fervor of many of the other peoples in the 1989-1990 period. They didn't perceive the system as totally broken then or in 1968. Instead, Dubček-led uh, government in 68 had decided simply to reform the system by providing more reforms and improvements through people-friendlier governments people-friendlier administration, and an expansion of individual freedoms. However, as the BBC noted on the 21st of August, 1968, Russia brings winter to Prague Spring. And it stayed so, even through spring of 1989 as I arrived in uh, the Czech Republic. Meanwhile, between summer 68 and the autumn of 1989, the borders between the socialist uh, Czechoslovakian East and East German states and West Germany were always of concern and were seen as a place where tensions needed to be constantly uh, under preparation uh, for activity between East and West. Geographically, Western uh, Czechoslovakia provided a bulge, uh, which is threatening because you go West, North, or South and to Germany. This is why German and NATO troops trained each year for an invasion from the Warsaw Pact states right there near the Fulda Gap, just north of what is the Bulge of Czechoslovakia. The Fulda Gap 
was the most focused on point of concern, but the border between southern Germany's Bavarian state was also seen as soft underbelly for an attack on NATO forces. Let me tell you about the unbearable lightness of Munich, Bavaria. Early in the morning of the, uh, the last Friday in April 1989, I found myself trying to sleep very early in the morning after staying up all night in the train station in Nuremberg. The train was chugging along and about to reach the Bavarian and Czech, uh, Czechoslovakian border. As the train rolled into the station uh, before the border, a German guard came into my cabin to check my passport. Later, a Czechoslovakian border patrol agent entered the train and took my passport, apparently to check it and then to stamp it for me. Um, as I stood in the hallway in front of my cabin awaiting the return of this Czechoslovakian border patrol agent, uh, the man ne in the cabin next to me began to telling me nervously in German his unforgettable narrations. This man stated that he could no longer live in the West and enjoy its system. The man was obviously homesick for family and familiar places where he had grown up just across the German border in his homeland. I think he was from the Pilsen area. This middle-aged man from Czechoslovakia had moved to live in, uh, I don't know how he escaped, in uh, um, Munich with his family. Uh, there he had to work very hard and most of his, the other Czech exiles there had to work hard as immigrants. He himself had spent the time working in, as a taxi driver part-time and doing other odd jobs for many years, but he was just eking out a living in the West. After several years of trying to make it in the West, this same middle-aged man, now nervously smoking a cigarette in front of me, made it clear that he had weighed his options and had determined that it would be best for him to return to live with his own family back in Czechoslovakia. The man observed soberly. This day, uh, I do not know what will happen to me. Perhaps I will be put in jail. When they identify me as a Czechoslovakian national who has overstayed his permit abroad by several years, it didn't matter to this Czechoslovakian male much anymore. He was ready to go home. The man assured me that he was ready to pay the price to be united with his family and his homeland. His melancholy was like those shared by characters in the classic film of 1988, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, based on the book by this, of the same title by uh, Milan Kundera. In Kundera's novel, the author is in constant dialectic with Friedrich Nietzsche, a, man, a German man who died hundreds of years ago. The illusion and the illusoriness of the Grand March is discussed. For Kundora's character Franz, probably <laughs> related to the name Franz Kafka, the Grand March is the belief that history brings progress and positive progress in human existence. Living is considered light by Kundora because one is faced with um, either trying to get one's dreams achieved or scratching out the reality of history. For Kundura, history is simply a straight line where nothing really repeats itself. And therefore, if one were to live one's life over, it would not, however, be any better because you would still repeat this, uh, the same path. Living is considered light by Kundura because one is faced with, with um, this dilemma. In summary, this is the melancholy sense of lightness throughout the movie and the book, referred to by Kondora in this title. We step on each other, we step on the points in history only once. The river continues on, but we are not in the same point on the line when we step out a second time. But if we were to go back in time, we would repeat our same path, a linear one. On the other hand, if we were to uh, the same person and we stepped into the changing river at the same point in time, then the fate of destiny of such a linear river would simply have us repeat the same path we had taken before. <laughs> God, we thank God that the river is not the same, but that's just the idea. Never really achieving the illusory progress we would seek on a repeat game, like in game theory. Um, nothing would play out differently if we were to repeat the game. 
The system or linear path of history will take care of itself. The individual has much less to say. Suddenly my transition, or excuse me, suddenly my train took off as he was telling the story. Uh, we began to travel into Czechoslovakia, chug, 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 that April 1989 morning. I returned to my train cabin at that moment, as did uh, my soon not to be seen anymore or no longer exiled Czech national friend entered his cabin. The train quickly stopped at the other side of the border and eventually took off again. In the meantime, I realized I had not gotten my passport back. Luckily, the passport was returned to me uh, after I went out and waited a few minutes outside my cabin. However, the man was gone. The man was already gone. Had he been taken to prison, or was he just being taken for questioning and then released, or had he simply escaped into the trees? I don't know. Let's take a break for a moment.